Good evening. I am Karen Taylor, Program Director of the General Society, and I'm so pleased that you can be with us this evening. This um, is going to be our final uh, lecture for the fall, and tonight's lecture is part of the Artist and Lecture series. Um, for those of you who may be less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York is a nonprofit organization that was founded by 22 artisans in 1785, 235 years ago. Today, our organization continues to serve and improve the quality of life for the people of the City of New York through our educational and, and cultural programs. These include um, our John M. Mossman Lock um, Museum, our um, Tuition Free Mechanics Institute, our lecture series, of which, of course, tonight's lecture is part of, and it was uh, founded in 1837. And finally, our library, which is currently celebrating 200 years as it was founded in 1820. During the lecture, there will be an opportunity to submit uh, typewritten questions through the Q&A section. And, and of course, at the end of the talk, you will also be able to submit questions as well. Um, the Q&A will be about 10 or 15 minutes in length, and we will uh, try and answer as many questions as we can in that time period. Tonight, we are so fortunate to have uh, John Taranak architectural and social historian, speaking on a topic very close to his art, subway maps. And before introducing John, I do want to mention that John's map, which he will be discussing, is available at the following independent bookstores. And that includes Shakespeare and Company, Book Culture and McNally Jackson, as well as through their websites. Coincidentally, the General Society also has a strong link to maps through a past General Society member and president, Andrew G. Hagstrom. Mr. Hagstrom, who also attended the Society's Mechanics Institute as a student and then instructor, um, founded Hagstrom Maps, one of the best-selling brands of maps in America. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. And with even greater synchronicity regarding tonight's talk, New York City subway used a, um, a Hagstrom design for its official subway maps during the 1940s and up to 1958. John Taranak writes on New York City's social and architectural history and teaches the subject at NYU's School of Professional Studies and he just happens to design maps as well. John fell into mapping as much by accident as design. With no training in studio art or graphics, he decided to chart the passageways of Midtown and Lower Manhattan. New York Magazine liked his roughs and had them metamorphosed into undercover maps. Mr. Toranak went on to chair the MTA subway map committee for the bulk of his existence in the late 1970s and he was the creative director and the award uh, and of the award-winning and critically praised 1979 MTA subway map. Um, his books include Manhattan's Little Secret, The Empire State Building, The Making of a Landmark, New York from the Air, and Elegant New York. He's also written numerous articles for many publications it is now my great pleasure to introduce to you, John Toranak. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Karen. I'm gonna to try to click this magic button and get us started here. Uh, this is one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons with two men leaning over a woman saying, one of them saying to the other, and I tell you, she doesn't have to change to 14th Street. Whether you're looking at a subway map or you have one in your head, there seems to be little agreement on how to get from A to B. And it's a major problem when actually mapping the subway. As you'll see, there are many ways to skin a map. Some good, some bad, some better. I'll just talk about official maps along with some of my interpretations 
on how to do it. Uh, the city's first successful subway, uh, the privately owned and operated Interborough Rapid Transit, opened in, 19, in October 1904. And curiously, there was no official map published for the general public. The map that you're looking at was not for public consumption. It was in a celebratory book published for the occasion by the IRT. And something that we usually forget is that in the, at the turn of the 20th century, the IRT wasn't just operating the subway, which you see in red on this map, it was also operating all the elevated lines, which you see in blue. In 1904, uh, the phrase interborough was actually a bit of a misnomer. It was really the intraborough. Uh, the subway was operating strictly in Manhattan uh, until about 1908. If you follow my cursor, this is City Hall down here, and the subway operated up uh, what, what had been Elm, uh, Elk Street, became Lafayette Street, got to Astor Place, went over to Park Avenue, so well, 4th Avenue, and up 4th Avenue, AKA Park Avenue to Grand Central at 42nd Street, where it zigged west on 42nd Street to Times Square and zagged north on Broadway up to 145th. What's, what's curious about this map is that it's flopped. What you see on the right is ordinarily on the left. And when you, when you translate a vertical island such as Manhattan into a horizontal uh, uh, image, you usually have the south on the left. Uh, by 1910, the IRT had published its first system map for the general public. And you can see that the flopped image was righted or lefted as it were. Interestingly, this map was a bit of a promotional tool as much as a didactic one. Uh, it showed the proposed extension of what had been the Broadway line down 7th Avenue in a dashed line and the proposed extensions, notice the plural, from Grand Central up Lexington Avenue, as well as 3rd Avenue, which was clearly never, never built. There wasn't any distinction made uh, between local and express stations uh, visually. All stations were recorded the same bullet. And it wouldn't be until 1967 that the numbers and letters that we know today would be accorded. Until then, it was just, you know, you're taking the Broadway 7th Avenue local to 28th Street. By 1924, this map was published and there was competition at the time in the form of the BMT or the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit, which was likewise privately owned and operated. The competition was tacitly acknowledged by the dual operation of the Flushing line out here. Uh, this is the Astoria line and this is the Flushing line. Uh, but despite that fact, to see this map is to believe that the IRT was the city's only subway. And you see that map right here on the subway car. This is clearly an IRT train, not a BMT. Uh, here, here is the proto map for the BMT. As you can see, originally the BMT was called the BRT, the Brooklyn Rapid Transit. And this is a map that, that the Transit BRT published in 1913 it was basically in house. This wasn't for general consumption, but you can see down here it says prior to its extension. Uh, this map was the prototype for later maps. And by 1917, uh, we see this map after the extension had been made. Uh, the BRT would start to be called the BMT, the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit, and it operated uh, by tunnels and bridges, both the Brooklyn Bridge for L's basically and the Manhattan Bridge for the subway. And it went up Broadway to Times Square uh, uh, and up 7th Avenue from Times Square and across 59th and 60th Streets into Queens. And here you see that dual operation of the 
BMT and IRT. Since the BMT went to Q or to Queens, you would think that, it, that its name would be changed to be the BMQT, but it never was. It was always just the BMT. Now, one of the features of this map that I particularly appreciate is that you see that there are some lines in black. What you see in black are true subway lines, subterranean, so it's dark down there. What you see in red are surface, e either operating at grade or on elevated. And you can see here, here's the real subway and it takes the Manhattan Bridge, so that's in red, and the rest of it in Manhattan is all black. Uh, what's interesting is that what you're looking at is a color-coded system alerting people to what is operating under the sun and what is operating underground. Now, by 1932, another, a third line, a bit of competition had opened and you can see that this is called the Independent City-Owned Rapid Transit Railroad System. It was called the Independent because this is the Depression, remember, this, the city of New York wanted to have more subway lines. Investors, uh, well, by the, the end of uh, World War I, the BMT was already bankrupt and the IRT was pretty low on funds. The city could not find a private developer uh, to develop and operate a subway system. So the city said, okay, if you guys won't do it, we'll do it. And it will be independent of private, of, 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 private, of any private investment. Hence it was called the IND. They simply dropped the in, in, mm -hmm. uh, dependent part of the name and called it the IND. Uh, the IND originally went from 207th Street and in Inwood down 8th Avenue, basically Central Park West and into Brooklyn. And there was a cross town line on 53rd Street into Queens. And there was the Concourse line up to 207th Street. Mm -hmm. Express stations uh, were in larger circles than local stations. Here's 59th Street, Columbus Circle, for instance. Here's 72nd Street, Central Park West, a local. Uh, this map was published by the Board of Transportation of the City of New York. But like its confrere, the IND did not acknowledge other subway lines. This, this depiction of the IND is a rather avant-garde depiction. Uh, it is not schematic, it is geographic, but it is trimmed down to focus on the routes themselves. Now here's a real mystery map. Uh, nobody can find the original of this anymore, uh, but it was 1938, and this is the first known New York City subway map showing each route, each subset of a set of lines in a separate color. Uh, breaking down subsets of trunk lines has advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages become more and more evident, culminating in the 1972 map. Uh, the, the compass, the comp, excuse me a second. Uh, I have to, uh, the compass rose here reflects Manhattanite skewed perspective of what is true north. To a Manhattanite, if you're walking up Sixth Avenue, you're walking north. When, of course, true north is a, at a 27 degree angle, basically, on our northwest line. Now, by the 1940s, thanks to the bankruptcy of the two privately operated lines, we had the three divisions under the border transportation. In this map, which was created, published by Mr. Hagstrom, uh, and this is one of my favorite maps, let me tell you. Uh, we had the three divisions depicted. Uh, each division was given its own color, as we see in this Hagstrom map. IRT was blue, BMT was yellow, and the IND was red. And each division in the Hagstrom map was created equal. 
unlike former maps. Uh, this map was sold both commercially and it came to be used by the Board of Transportation as the official map of the subways. And it was produced for years in different guises for both official and commercial use. Hagstrom kept the copyright even when published under the imprimatur of the city's Board of Transportation. It was also the first official map to show all divisions created equal. Here's a close up of Midtown. Uh, my mantra is clarity is king. And this is a royal example. Each line, for instance, has a black hairline flanking it to accentuate the color, uh, which additionally masks any misregistration of plates. Type is in the clear and where there's congestion, the station name is linked to the station by an arrow with a gentle curve to its shaft. Where more than one station has the same name, the curved line acts as a lasso, grouping all the stations together. Now, not all iterations of this Hagstrom map were indeed uh, created equal. In the maps mounted in the subway cars themselves, some lines were created more equal than others. Each division was highlighted. Here's what you would have seen in an IRT car with the blue highlighted. Here's what you would have seen in an MTA car with the yellow highlighted. And here's what you would have seen in an IND car with the red highlighted. Now Hagstrom remained the official transit authority map until 1958. That's when a new map was created by designer George Solomon. Solomon's goal was to simplify the system and he tried to show it schematically while still adhering to geographic principles. Distortion nevertheless was inevitable. This iteration dates from 1964. Uh, express circles, uh, I'm sorry, express stations are circles with X's in them. Local stations are hash marks. Notice the streets of operation are an integral part of the station name. This is a great breakthrough. And uh, whether to put secondary names first or second is up for grabs. Uh, you see 59th Street Columbus Circle down here. And up here you see Columbia University 116th Street. Uh, it was basically a toss up. Uh, these numbers along 8th Avenue or Central Park West here indicate places of interest. 29, um, these are all meant to be grouped around 81st Street. 29 is the Museum of Natural History. 31 is the New York Historical Society. And 18, which is a little out of geog geographical perspective, was for the Hayden Planetarium. But it was a nice touch. The route names are surprinted on the lines themselves. And I have to assume that Solomon was a Brooklyn boy because he calls the Brooklyn BMT, the Sea Beach and West End line, as we see here, and the Brighton Fourth Avenue line, as we see here. Uh, both both in integral parts of the, of the BMT. In 1964, the MTA published a special edition of the map highlighting the number seven flushing line as the way to get to the World's Fair. Interestingly, station names in the, in the Solomon map are the color of the line that stops at the station. There are ambiguities, however, such as where one trunk line intersects another. Up here at Columbus, 59th Street, Columbus Circle, we only see a red for the station name. Uh, ignoring the fact that the number one Broadway 7th Avenue line also stops at that, com at that complex. And the geography is on this map is thrown completely out of whack, which is an inherent drawback in schematic maps. The local, for instance, appears blocks away from the IND. And look at these stations. Uh, uh, at 6th Avenue and 47th Street uh, and along 53rd Street. They're all indicated as express stations, aren't they? Well, the, the lines that might be stopping there are express or dubbed express lines, but they're making all local stops. 
And this is a problem that still nags uh, the MTA maps. In 1968, the TA has a new logo, complete with a compass rose here that indicates true north, and it's a new map. It's slightly more geographic than George Solomon's and was brought about by a contest. Two entrants, one a lawyer by vocation, the other a 16 year old who went on to become a transportation planner were co-winners and they both wound up working at the MTA. A new color coding system accorded an individual color to each of the subsets of the line, just as the IND had done. And part-time service is shown by a, by a dashed line. It's a geographically distinctive feature. The service at each station is in boxes right on the line. It makes for a fast read, doesn't it? And although, and although there's no graphic distinction between express and local stations, express station names are in red, local stations are in black. And where you find correspondence, as the French would, would call intermodality, you see the 59th Street Columbus Circle here for the number one in black and 59th Street Columbus Circle here in red for the IND. You also see a circle with a T within. That indicates an inter-trunk line transfer. And it was under the Board of, of uh, Transportation and later the TA that they started opening up inter-trunk line connections. You know, when, when the BMT opened, there were no connections with the IR, with the IRT to, at the outset. Um, we, st we still have the geographical problem at Columbus Circle, however, you know, the number one, the red, blue, and orange lines appear blocks away from 8th Avenue or Central Park West, uh, but that's an inherent defect in, uh, in schematic maps. Now, in the 1930s, uh, the London Underground published this map. Uh, it was the first truly diagrammatic subway map, and it was designed by a London transport employee named Harry Beck. Uh, by the, well, the 1970s, uh, Massimo Vignelli, who was an advocate of the Bauhaus school, remember the Bauhaus preached that less was more, uh, Vignelli would be influenced by this map. With some differences, uh, the underground map graphically depicted vagaries of service, such as peak hours only, just as the 1968 MTA map had used a dashed line for part-time service, Vignelli, of course, would include nothing as esoteric as when a station might actually be served by an individual line. And here is Massimo Vignelli's New York City subway map, which was published in the summer of 1972. If any map ever threw me into a tizzy, it was the Vignelli map. And here's just one reason why. It was James Wines, an architect and professor at Parsons, who wrote a variation on this message in 1988. Graphic design is the solution of a practical problem with an overlay of aesthetics. Massimo Vignelli turned that notion on its head. Uh, the 1972 Vignelli map is perhaps the most aesthetically pleasing map ever designed but as a subway map, it's also the least useful. I do not consider myself an aesthetician. I consider myself a pragmatist. And as far as I'm concerned, if a hastily drawn map on the back of an envelope puts things into perspective and gets you from A to B, that map works. Vignelli's aesthetic minimalism does not. From Vignelli's perspective, regardless of the natural lines of the city, the angles had to be 45, 90, or 180 degrees. He had gray parks and beige water. Uh, perhaps those colors reflected a certain cynical reality in 1972, with the city in a financial pickle 
the city's park system was underfinanced and moribund and the water, well, the water was brown. But, these, but those colors are not the cartographic verities. Parks are green, water is blue. All you have to do is ask any fifth grader. Predecessor maps both here and in London included variations on service, none of which is evident in the Vignelli map. And that's complicated by the fact that unlike the average underground, New York has express and local service. And the only manifestation of it here is that express stations are in boldface type, local and regular way. And you have to connect the dots, all of which is pretty weak. There's no flag at stations that indicates which line is operating express and which is operating local, complicated by the fact that if you find a dot at a station, you then have to seek out the number or letter that corresponds with it. Here you are, for instance, at 28th Street Park Avenue, so Park Ave, so I'll talk about that in a minute. You have to go up here to find that the yellow line is the number six. And for some bizarre reason, the numbers on the uh, Lexington Avenue line here are tipped 90 degrees. I mean, that, that, you know, that makes it illegible, doesn't it? And as I said, legibility is king. Uh, This is, all, this is all complicated by the fact that no distinction is made at the station to indicate which line does what when, whether it's only operating weekdays or rush hours, et cetera. And why abbreviate when you have plenty of room? What does Park Ave so mean? Uh, S would do fine, but when you're, when you're uh, abbreviating anything, ideally what you drop are the vowels, you keep the consonants. STH is a much better abbreviation of South than SO. Now, if you continue North on Park Avenue, you come to Grand Central and suddenly Park Avenue changes its name, doesn't it? it becomes Lexington Avenue. Well, Vignelli ignored the fact that the uptown Lexington Avenue line at about 41st Street starts bearing East and it goes over to Lexington Avenue. But that did not fit his sense of aestheticism. You know, a, a line that curved uh, was a no-no as far as he was concerned. Uh, and what do you think happens to the geography? The geography gets worse. Uh, because of Vignelli's fearful symmetry, where do we find 50th Street and Broadway? You know, it's bad enough I pointed out where 59th Street on the number one was in former maps. Here we have 50th Street Broadway west of 8th Avenue. Now, if you know anything about Manhattan North South streets, you know that 50th Street and Broadway ain't west of 8th Avenue. Uh, 59th Street Columbus Circle suffers the same geographic problem as we saw in uh, earlier iterations. And <laughs> you, pro you probably think that it's hard to believe, but the geography gets worse. Here we are in Lower Manhattan. Here's the number one line terminating at South Ferry. Vignelli depicts the South Ferry Station west of Bowling Green, and he depicts Bowling Green north of Rector Street. Uh, in those days, there was a strange shuttle between Bowling Green and the South Ferry Station, uh, but this iteration makes no sense at all. Uh, if, if you know the, the new complex, the IRT is as far west as the Whitehall Street Station on the BMT. And the Whitehall Street station is between Water and uh, South Streets. And if you go any further east, you're gonna wind up in the East River. But look at where Whitehall Street is here on this map. Um, upon publication of the Vignelli map uh, in the summer of 1972, I, I, the first thing I did was turn to my trusty Hagstrom 
and I drew the, light, the roots in their new color coding on a sheet of tissue paper. I quickly concluded that it wasn't going to work. I realized that what was, what was needed was a color coded system modeled on the London Underground. If you'll excuse me one second, I'm trying to fix something here that uh, is confounding me. But I don't seem to be able to do it. Um, so um, as uh, as Karen mentioned uh, in well six months uh, before the Vignelli map was published. Uh, my first maps were published by New York Magazine and they made the cover, as you can see, there was nothing Jean Valjean like uh, the way this cover depicts it. Uh, but uh, this was six months before the Vignelli map was, was published. And uh, a later, uh, let me see, a later map, uh, or a later story was on the subways. Uh, this is, was published by uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation and it dealt with the bar reliefs and mosaics in the subway. And let me see. Well, I, I messed up, I forgot to show something. Uh, but in the, in the summer of 72, the same summer that uh, the Vignelli map was published. A story ran on uh, in New York Magazine that I wrote called "High Noon and Nothing to Do," and one of the one of the subjects was under the headline "Under Lock and Key." And what do you think I had written about? Right, the Mossman collection of locks at the uh, host of our production here tonight. Uh, in 1973 and 74, I wrote the guidebooks to the culture bus loops that the MTA was operating as a freelance project for the uh, Municipal Arts Society. And the then executive director of the MTA liked those guidebooks and he asked if I was interested in writing a, an official MTA travel guide to New York. So I started, I went to work for the MTA and started working on this in fall of 74. And only a year and a half later, it was published in the spring of 76. And at that time, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, I did undercover maps. Uh, this was for a special edition. And, oh, I, I forgot some, to show something here. Um, included in this travel guide was the first geographic subway map published under the aegis of the MTA. Uh, the designer, Mike Hertz, didn't have time to start afresh from, uh, with it and build his own uh, base map, so he adapted a city planning commission map. And it it, in, it had a variation to the, uh, well, I, I'll start up here. I rejected, of course, having the Vignelli map uh, in, in, the, in the travel guide. Uh, one of the reasons is if you count how many north-south lines there are here, I think you get 18 different colors. Well, if you have 18 different colors, clearly you cannot use that color coding system uh, because it throws all geography out of whack. Uh, what we showed uh, was having the subway routes depicted monochromatically, only in red. Why? The MTA, uh, the Transit Authority, uh, did not believe that well, they were not willing to change the color coding system for the sake of one publication. 
they regarded it as the tail wagging the dog. Nor would they revert to the tricolor, the tricolor system where the IRT was one color, the BMT a second, and the IND a third, because that was passe by then. So what we did was we, we delineated the, the lines in red, and we had color-coded disks operating alongside. Not perfectly, however. Uh, the E, for instance, diverts from 8th Avenue north of 50th Street and goes to 53rd Street. We only show the E over here. It should be ideally here to show that it's turning. Uh, also, there were some things, and this is probably my doing as much as anybody else's because I was re the responsible one. I thought it was most important to show the service at the station first and then the station name. Uh, in the 1979 map, we reversed the order to have the station name first. Uh, streets of operation ran alongside the, the route of the line. Uh, here's, uh, and we have place names like Times Square worked in. Here's Broadway, here's 8th Avenue, etc. Uh, now, by the time the, the travel guide was published in the spring of 76, a committee of transit authority and MTA staff, along, along with public transportation activists, had begun to meet to discuss a new subway map. I wound up chairing the committee for the bulk of its existence and directing the work. And I wound up being the creative director of the subway map. Uh, here is the map that we tested in 1978. And you can see that down here in the bottom left-hand corner is an enlarged version of Midtown and Lower Manhattan and of downtown Brooklyn. Uh, and up here is the legend, et cetera. Uh, we, we printed this map and we tested it. We mounted a show at the City and a Gallery, showed a retrospective of sub New York City subway maps. And we asked uh, questions about this map. The questionnaire was, was created by Dr. Arlene Bronzaft, who was a committee member. Uh, she taught psychology at Lehman College. And what we learned uh, was A, People liked the geographic approach uh, in opposition to the schematic approach. And B, uh, they liked or wanted something that we knew was evident all along, and that was a color, a better de delineation of the lines. Seemingly to a, to a, a respondent, uh, the word was, we need a color coding system that worked. Um, and here is uh, here's a closer detail of, of the 1979 test map. We, we tried delineating transfers a little more carefully by having yellow boxes. But you'll see that the, the land mass is white and the streets are gray. Street names are black and they're off the lines for legibility. Uh, this, is, this is the beginning of the 1979 map. And there, there were great similarities between the, the test map uh, and, the tra and the travel guide. And then you can see the, the, the addition of the yellow boxes. Uh, unlike the travel guide, the name of the station is more sensibly placed to pre precede the service. And we delineated part-time versus uh, full-time service. Full-time service in this iteration has italicized boldface letters or numbers and part-time are in Roman regular weight type. Uh, this, this was uh, a pretty major breakthrough. Um, and you can see the terminals are in boxes. Here's the 42nd Street shuttle and here's the number seven flushing line. Uh, but the critical problem was the monochromatic approach. Uh, Phyllis Cerf Wagner, who was the widow of the publisher Bennett Cerf and the wife of former mayor Robert Wagner, was a dollar a year consultant on aesthetics to the MTA. And one 
afternoon in August 1978. She asked how progress was coming on the map. And I told her we we're dead in the water. And she asked why. And I explained to her that we needed a new color coding system. She asked if I would show her a sample. And I said that none had been made. We only, only talked about. But uh, I asked Nobu Sarasi, who was working for Mike Hertz at the time, if he could draw up some samples. At the time, I did not care what color was ascribed to each line. And Nobu drew up about a half a dozen different iterations. And here is a sample. And you can see signatures up here. I was told like, like John Hancock, I had to sign it first and biggest. This is Hugh Dunn, who was a consultant. Here's Phyllis Wagner. I'm sorry, this is Nobu and here's Phyllis Wagner. Uh, Mrs. Wagner took a look at these samples. She said they made sense to her. She called Chairman Harold Fisher. Fisher said, come up to my office and I'll take a look at, at what you were talking about. He took a look at the proposals. He said, this makes sense to me. He called John DeRoos, the president of the Transit Authority and a meeting was arranged for that afternoon at two o'clock. By five afternoon, it was a fait accompli. It had only taken four years. Uh, and here, here you see some dry runs. We we're trying to figure out which line, which color to ascribe to which line. And here you see a draft of the service guide. This was drawn up by one of the committee members, Joe Corman. And here uh, is the finished product. The inset in the bottom left-hand corner that had been in the prototype is gone and the entire map is that much proportionately larger. Uh, the key to the map and service guide were in the top right hand corner. Uh, this map is much more sophisticated than the prototype. And again, I ascribe the, uh, the glory of this map to Nobu Sarasi. Uh, I was interviewed by a Barnard student the other day and she used the phrase the balance between the map's functionality and aesthetic pleasure, which I think you will agree is here in this iteration. This printing job dates from, well, from about 1981. Station names preceded the service. Full-time service was depicted in boldface, italic, part-time in regular wake Roman. But, and I have a caveat emptor here, uh, how do you define part-time service? Uh, it can be any number of, of, of times and there'll be more to come on that. Uh, station names ordinarily, but not always uh, are preceded by the number of the streets. Here we see 4750th Street under with Rockefeller Center under it. Here we see Union Square, 14th Street. Here we see 59th Street, Columbus Circle. Here we see Times Square, 42nd Street. Who knows? It was a toss of the coin. Uh, express stations were in circles, uh, local stations in hash marks. Uh, sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? But it worked. Uh, that standard was applied down here at 59th Street, Columbus Circle. You can see that there's a circle on the blue and orange lines, which means that this is the IND station. And here's a rectangle on the red uh, one, two, and three, where the number one stops. Uh, the, still, you know, the landmass was white, the streets were pale gray, streets of operation ran alongside the routes. And here's a sample of the columnar service guide, uh, which, which told you basically the, the critical information as to when things were operating and where. And on the back uh, was a complete set of strip maps or non-geographic depictions of the operation of a line, complete with intermodal information uh, at every station. And there was one critical element that was part of the strip maps. Uh, light night service was included. Uh, and you notice the crescent moons here at 63rd Drive, Queens Boulevard and Rio Park. That's telling you that although the F line ordinarily bypasses that station, at nights it stops there. 
And you can see on this close up all the buses that can be caught at station. This would be daytime service, not necessarily uh, late night. And here are the subway connections at Roosevelt Island, et cetera. A month after the maps publication in June of 19, uh, which was in June, 1979, the New York Times read an editorial headlined, the best subway map in years. Paul Goldberg, the architectural critic for the Times, a month later, headlined a story called, uh, at, la at last, a usable subway map. And in 1981, the National Endowment for the Arts and the, Na and the US Department of Transportation accorded the map a commendation for design excellence. Not half bad, right? Uh, in 1998, uh, the Transit Authority introduced a revised map on the bones of the 1979 map. And this is a slightly later uh, printing job. Uh, they, the, the MTA decided that they were gonna have one publication uh, for everything under their domain, including the railroads, Long Island Railroad and Metro North. Uh, they include Staten Island Rapid Transit down here. Uh, and also on the back along with the, the railroads was a map of bridges operated by the MTA. Uh, critical elements such as the service guide uh, started being deleted and added at key stations were leaders leading to balloons, which gave information on intermodality, all the information that we had had on the back on the strip maps. I like to think that all the panache and charm of the 1979 map are gone. Uh, Here's a, here, here's a closer view of it. And you can see these balloons, uh, with the leaders cluttering up the map. Uh, and aside from cluttering up the map, the problem of course, is that if you need to know intermodal information that is station, station that is not considered key, you're out of luck. And the aesthetics continue to go downhill with messiness on the rise. Look at the type here. This is meant to tell you that the queue is stopping at Times Square, 42nd Street, but you really, it's the, the queue is really obliterated by the blue line. Today's printed map uh, is, still with, is still with the balloons. Uh, this is 20 plus years after they have been introduced. Uh, there is a slight difference uh, in today's iteration to tell you what's express and local. Today, instead of a color-coded circle uh, at an express station, you have a, a circle with white infill with a black ring and the reverse at local stations. You still have uh, streets of operation running alongside the map. Uh, you don't have any further uh, information on part-time versus full-time service. The A is full-time, the B and the C are part-time and the one a full-time. But again, when is, when is part-time versus full-time? And here's the, here's the MTA uh, note. Uh, I don't have that. Um, I do want to point out uh, that, well, here there are numbers uh, in bullets running alongside the route but they are missing at key stations. And this is how the, how this, the express and local service is depicted at 59th Street Columbus Circle. You can see that the express, the, the black rimmed white circle is over the blue and orange lines indicating this is where the IND express service is. And here on this red line is a black circle to tell you that the local is there. Now, stunningly, today's MTA map only shows weekday service. Uh, five days a week. Uh, and as this note indicates, on weekends and late nights, these routes change. Well, 
I, <laughs> I hate to tell you, but if you are looking at the B, and we were we were just looking at it here. Here's here's the B. Uh, if you're looking at the B, and there's no service on the B weekends, and the MTA is telling you to tell you to use the C, the D, or the Q. Well, if you take the C, you're not going to get to Seventh Avenue, Fifty Third Street, for instance, uh, where the B stops. If you take the D you're not gonna to get to 72nd Street Central Park West where the B stops. Or if you take the Q, you're not gonna to get to 59th Street Columbus Circle where the B stops. Uh, so uh, I don't know what, what the uh, plan for the MTA is, but this is clearly a bad one. Um, but again, I show here the 59th Street Columbus Circle Express service. Uh, and remember, uh, I was talking about how streets of operation run alongside service. Well, this is this is the highly fault vaunted uh, new Second Avenue subway. Do you see Second Avenue running alongside here? The way you see Lexington Avenue running alongside the Lexington Avenue line? No, it isn't here. You only see Second Avenue up here as a non-operational street. And also uh, the, the MTA is using gray type against the beige background, which makes it pretty illegible. Uh, but this map uh, has this balloon here blocking what is east, if far east on 86th Street, for instance. And here is the same map uh, on the website of the MTA, sans balloons, mercifully. But what do we see at 86th Street here? We see 86th Street entering, uh, and actually entering this anonymous park, which is Carl Short's Park. And here's York Avenue. This map has Carl Short's Park with its western flank on York Avenue which ain't the case. Uh, what they have ignored is East End Avenue running along here. And East End Avenue is the Western end of Carl Shorts Park. And Carl Shorts Park does not end in this teardrop-like sign. Uh, it ends at uh, Gracie Terrace, which is in essence of an extension of 84th Street. It ends flat. Um, I've been, I've been carping about full-time versus part-time service. Um, this is a map uh, that I did under the Aegis of Taranak maps in the early 1990s. And do you see this dagger behind uh, following the Z? That's telling you that the Z is rush hour service. Uh, it was my first attempt at delineating what some of the part-time service is. Because remember, part-time service can be weekdays only, weekends only, rush hours only. It can indicate service that skips the station rush hours because another line is filling in for it, etc. I showed uh, in this iteration local service. Remember the nine was operating in those days. I, I show local service in rectangles and express stations in circles or ovals. Uh, this is not perfected yet, uh, but it's a beginning. You also see that terminals are in rectangles in the color of the line that terminates there with the name. So here we see the South Ferry on the red line and Broad Street on the brown line and Brooklyn Bridge on the green line, etc. Now, if you notice, down at the bottom, what do I see here? I say weekdays. Unlike the, the M, today's MTA map, this map, which was published in the early 1990s, had the main map as the weekday map with two ancillary maps, one depicting weekend service and the, the other depicting late night service, which you see here. 
also with service uh, with service guide. Here's the subway service guide for late nights, 12 midnight to 6 a.m. Uh, the, the map is as simple as I could make it uh, because the, there was a problem with space. Uh, but in this iteration, you start to see further delineation of the service at 59th Street Columbus Circle, for instance, don't you? What have I started doing? I've started putting weekday service in red. That red acts as a flag, it's a watch it. It means if you're standing there on Saturday morning waiting for the B train, you're gonna be standing there until Monday morning because it only operates weekdays. And I've started making a more finely delineated uh, depiction of the local service at express stations because to group, group them all together is misleading. And this will be more finely delineated as I go along. Uh, you can see that, that now I'm starting to put, here's Times Square with a seven and seven X terminating there in the shuttle. I've started adding the service that terminates in the terminal boxes. And what, what has been missing from all New York City subway maps, as far as I know, until I started the 1990s, including it, and that is an index of stations. Clearly the London Underground map has an index of stations. Paris Metro has an index of stations. So I started including an index of stations and I didn't give just the grid coordinates. I also tell you what you can, you, here we are, Fifth Avenue, 42nd Street, the number seven stops there and you can transfer to the B, the D, the F and the M at a station with a different name. And you know, the flags are there, watch it, the B and the M are only weekday service, etc. And a year ago last summer, uh, I sent out a release to the press uh, showing the MTA map on the left and how I thought it should look. My iteration is on the right. Uh, I thought that uh, I could uh, make the map more didactic and aesthetically pleasing. And the iteration on the right includes my standards, uh, which I'll go into. Uh, that that release uh, resulted in this story in the New York Post. And I set out to make my own quasi-geographic map. And here is the poster version of it. Uh, this measures 24 by 36 inches. And here is the cover of the pocket map. Uh, unlike today's map, which only depicts weekday service, this map includes weekday and weekend service on the main map, but thanks to color coding the, the service. Plus there's a late night map, which makes the combined service 24 uh, seven. Plus it comes with an index of stations with all the ancillary information and a service guide, of course, plus there's a local rail map. And here is the map. Uh, in, the, in the pocket size version. Uh, you can see that up here, there's a service guide uh, arranged by trunk line and within each trunk line, it's numeric, an alphanumeric system. And down here is an introduction to the system. You know, I say that it's up and, you know, up and, up, up and running 24 hours a day, seven days a week under normal circumstances. And here's a key to the map, et cetera. Uh, on the reverse uh, is a late night subway map that also includes a service guide, of course. And here is the rail map showing connections with all the subways, etc. cetera. Uh, it, se it seems to me that this kind of presentation makes sense because I try, I, what I'm trying to do in this iteration is bring things together that are ordinarily on separate maps. Uh, and of course, I, uh, I have a, an index, stations, uh, complete, the index is complete with the primary name of the station, 
coupled with the streets of operation and any secondary name, such as Lincoln Center or Hunter College. The grid coordinates are there, of course, plus features at the station, such as whether it's handicapped accessible, and the service at the station, plus the bus connections that you can make at the station. Uh, and of course, there's rail information, etc., and buses to the airport. Now, one of the features of my new maps is the choice of Myriad typeface over Helvetica. Uh, Myriad is simply clearer as far as I'm concerned, and it's more finely delineated than, than Helvetica. It also takes up less room horizontally, and where every pica counts, that's a real blessing. Just look at the sea here in Helvetica. Look at the sea in Myriad. You notice that they basically took this much. Whoops, that was wrong. They basically took this much and simply dropped it in the Myriad. Still perfectly legible, but it takes up less room horizontally. Now, on my map, our service is right on the line for a faster read. Express service is in circles or ovals. Local service is in right angle uh, boxes. Uh, and you can, you can tell that here at 96th Street Broadway, the one is operating local, the two and the three are operating express. I give the street of operation as an integral part of the station name. I try to name as many uh, avenues as possible. Uh, you'll also see that, that uh, down here at, uh, for instance, 72nd Street Broadway, uh, I don't ignore the fact that Amsterdam Avenue is right there because at 72nd Street, Broadway is, is, is intersecting the right angled Amsterdam Avenue. So I say uh, Broadway and I use the symbol hat, Amsterdam Avenue. Uh, another thing that I do uh, is I have white hairlines flanking all of the service and even the station symbols uh, and symbols like this and the handicapped symbols, etc. cetera. Um, station names are in boldface type. Uh, you don't have to go looking for the street of operation because it's there as an integral part. And the, the, uh, there's, there's, a, there's also sort of a pecking order of information that I use. I think that the streets of operation are more important than secondary names such as Lincoln Center. Um, so I, I give the streets of operation first and then the places of interest second. Uh, and you might remember that I had started depicting weekend, I'm um, sorry, week, yeah, weekend service in red, uh, but that's only the start of it. Remember part-time service is a phrase that, that uh, takes into account many things. Uh, whether it's weekday, weekend, etc. So what I've done is I've developed an entire color coding system for service. A black letter or number serves the station every day. A red letter serves the station weekdays. A pink letter serves the station weekends. A blue letter or number serves the station rush hours. And a gray letter indicates that the service skips the station rush hour. And you'll notice that uh, I try to use percentages of whole, of whole colors. So this is 100% magenta. This is maybe 60% magenta. Uh, this gray D is 60% black. Uh, I do that because of registration. I want to make sure that, there's, that the registration is good. Now, here, here's an example of how my map differs from the MTA map. Uh, the MTA map is on the left here. Mine is on the right. And this is, this is the Canal Street complex at Broadway and Lafayette Street and Center Street. And these samples illustrate how the combination of improved cartographic signage can explain what, what lines operate 
at the station where, and it can help show where, where the station, where, where the service is. An immediate question on the MTA map here on the left is which number or letter applies to what color? Is the J on the yellow line? You know, if you don't know what color the J is, you're sort of lost, aren't you? Uh, in my version, uh, the J is clearly on the blue line. Also, uh, in this iteration, and remember the Canal Street complex is truly a complex. Three lines converge on it. One of those lines is on two separate sets of tracks and has two separate stations. Uh, one of those stations has the R and W uh, on basically on the on the Broadway end, and at sort of a crosstown station, you have the N and the Q, and you can see that they're operating express here, weekdays, and the Q the N is operating weekdays as an express, and uh, and the Q is operating full time, but. You see the N up here in a little box in pink. That's telling you that weekends, the N is also operating, but it's operating local. Here, you're just told that the N is operating full-time. No further delineation than that. Uh, the specificity of symbols and color-coded system, I like to think further demystifies, uh, decomplexifies, as it were, the complex. Uh, you can see at a glance what's happening here on the right, whereas here, uh, you know, who knows what's going on. Uh, also, uh, you have a legibility factor. You have the S sir, printed on the black, you have the C sir, printed on the yellow here with a black line behind it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a bit of a mess, isn't it? Uh, the subject of clarity, of clarity uh, where, you know, where the MTA map just overprints on my map, when I have to print on a line, the color of the line is probably cut by 50%. Uh, and I dropped the black hairline on the yellow line uh, and everything is, in the, is, is clear and legible, un, unlike over here on the MTA map. And here's another example. Uh, this is at the tip of Manhattan Island. Uh, on the, this is my iteration and this is the MTAs on the top. Uh, one of the things that this map, the, the MTA map tells you is that the five terminates here, right? It's in a box. Uh, well, the truth of the matter is that the five is extended to Brooklyn uh, during the weekdays, five days a week from, I don't know, eight in the morning to maybe seven or eight o'clock at night. So I depict the terminal here at Bowling Green as a part-time terminal, I have the box uh, filled with white uh, with a green frame around it to indicate that that's the trunk line we're talking about. Uh, here you have print type printed right on top of the line, the R and the Y and South Ferry are not terribly legible. Uh, here, everything is in the open. Plus I've used color-coded disks to indicate wh what is happening I indicate that Whitehall Street is a full-time terminal for the W. You don't see it over here, do you? You only see the R. Here you see the R and the W heading up Broadway. Uh, the five, I indicate as a part-time terminal. Here I show in the dashed line. And here in the solid line, you see the four because it's always going to Brooklyn. And here you see the disc for the five. Uh, so I, I like to think that I've clarified that service. Now, more basic stuff. Uh, the express and local stations at 59th Street, Columbus Circle on the MTA map here are not terribly specific, are they? Uh, 
But this iteration looks pretty good compared with other local and express stations on the MTA map. Uh, the MTA map is here on the left, and my map is on the right. Uh, at, yeah, your choice, whether it's 42nd Street, Grand Central, or Grand Central 42nd Street, all that you see is one large white circle with a black hairline around it. And down here at 14th Street Union Square, you see one large oval uh, with the same coloring. Um, interesting. Uh, you can see the relationships of the service here at 42nd Street Ground Central on my map. Here's the 42nd Street shuttle in a right in a square to indicate that it operates at Fogel. And it is at the west end of the station in reality. Here, uh, I show 33rd Street Park Avenue, and here's the Zig over to Lexington Avenue. And I show that the four and the five are operating express, and the six is operating local. And I show there's a connection to the number seven. Uh, and the number seven is in a rectangle because it's operating local. Uh, I also show that uh, you can get there is handicapped access for the four, five, six, and seven, but not for the shuttle. I also show that you can catch Metro North Railroad there. Um, if we look at 14th Street Union Square, uh, there are all these lines that you can catch, the LNQRW456, uh, but where are they? Who knows? Uh, here, it's fairly clearly delineated. Uh, at the West End, this is, this is Union Square. Remember, this is uh, 4th Avenue or Union Square East. This is Broadway here. Uh, you can see that in the oval, the N is operating weekdays, the Q full-time as express. You can see that the N is operating weekends local, the R is operating full-time local, and the W is operating weekdays local. And here's the L, the, the Canarsie line tucked in between them. And here's the local six and the express four and five. I think it's, I think that by breaking it down in that fashion, it makes more sense. Um, <laughs> I talked earlier about uh, the BMT map, color coding uh, stations that are outdoors by including it in red. Well, I've decided that we should do, I should do the same thing. Uh, this, this, this is Brooklyn. Uh, can you imagine uh, how much of the subway as we know the subway is operating in Brooklyn? Not much. Uh, in fact, uh, when you think of the subway, uh, it's stunning when you realize that more than two fifths of the stations, of the system stations, 194 of, uh, the, 100, of the 472 by my count are above ground. Uh, and on my map, these stations are identified by orange discs uh, representing the sun. Now, the suns serve as great flags. If you're on the number one train, for instance, and you're going north, going uptown to 137th Street Broadway at for City College, the station before 137th is 125th. And it's more than seeing the sun in the morning and the moon at night. Uh, the ambience at, at an above ground station is totally different. Uh, so you're told that the station before 137th is outdoors. And conversely, if you're going downtown on the number one to 116th Street, Columbia, uh, you're told that the station before it is out of doors. Now, interestingly, uh, back in 1978, Elliot Walensky, who was the first vice chairman of the Landmark Preservation Commission and the co-author of the AIA Guide, wrote a long handwritten note to me 
and he advocated that we show service on bridges uh, by having it uh, in a separate symbol. Well, we didn't do that in 1979, but I'm doing it these days. Here's, here's the Manhattan Bridge. Uh, so you know that when you're between Brooklyn, and this is Dumbo uh, down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass, uh, when you're between Brooklyn and Manhattan, you'll be taking the Brooklyn Bridge. It also offers a great view of the city. Uh, something that you might have noticed uh, are no U-turn symbols, such as it here, such as here at 86th and 79th. Uh, they serve as a double flag. One flag is to warn entering passengers that an entrance will only lead to one direction. The other flag uh, is uh, is to know, is to alert people who are already on the train and who want to, uh, who fail to get off at the station that they desire. Uh, so if you wanted to get off the subway at 79th Street Broadway, but you missed your stop, this map is telling you don't get off at 86th Street because you can't reverse your, your direction there without paying another fare. Go to 96th Street. Here's a more dramatic example. If you wanted to get off at, uh, Seven, uh, 68th Street, Hunter College, but you didn't, do not get off at 77. The next station is 86th Street, which is an express station. And you would assume that you can reverse direction at 86th Street, but you can't, uh, curiously. Uh, in fact, um, there are only two express stations that I know where you cannot reverse your direction. Uh, one is here at 86th Street, Lexington Avenue. The other is at Nostrand Avenue on the AC in Brooklyn. Um, showing uh, the 1979 map, uh, we tried to include discs to indicate when a, light, when a line veered off. Here we see the two and the three quite clearly diverting from the Broadway line and heading over to Harlem. Here's today's MTA map. Those two and the three disks are missing. They're shown here, the one, two and three disks here, but not here where it's really critical. Uh, here's how I depict it. Uh, it is readily apparent that the two and three turn off on the uptown run and vice versa. And today's map, uh, you see the 53rd street with its orange and blue lines demonstrates how that standard has fallen by the wayside even more dramatically. No discs, period. Uh, here's my iteration. It's quite clear that the E is turning east from 8th Avenue and the A and the C are continuing on 8th. It's quite clear that the B and the D on the orange line are turning west on 53rd, that the F continues north and that the M is turning east. And here we have this same express problem that I mentioned earlier on, on earlier maps. This circle is indicating it's an express station, 7th Avenue, 53rd, Lexington Avenue, 47th, 50th Street on 6th Avenue. All those stations are local, uh, but they're indicated as express stations. I like to think that I indicate that they're all local stations. Here's Seventh Avenue, is Fifth Avenue, is Lexington, etc. And remember, there's a certain Cartesian regularity to Manhattan's average numbered avenues. They're straight up and down, uh, but the MTA map on the left has First, Second, and Third Avenues at an angle south of Thirty Fourth Street. Here's Thirty Fourth Street. Here they start angling. Uh, it's because it was the only way that uh, designers could figure out how to incorporate Third Avenue and First Avenue on the L line. Um, I like to think that I've managed to do it. Uh, I put the L service under it and the 14th Street information uh, horizontally. And here we are on the Lower East Side, AKA Alphabet City. 
but we're on the MTA map or avenues A, B, C, and D. They're not. Uh, I show avenues A, B, C, and D. I even show avenue C continuing north of 14th Street and going up to 23rd. It flanks Stuyvesant Town. Uh, also, um, this is Tompkins Square, and this is the MTA map. Interestingly, uh, the MTA map has the it has 8th Street bisecting Tompkins Square, which will come to a surprise to any uh, driver of the M8 Crosstown bus uh, because you have to circumnavigate uh, Tompkins Square. You can't drive through it. Here it is depicted uh, accurately. Now, uh, with all that carping about today's MTA map, about six weeks ago, the MTA came out with a new digitized map. It's a great idea, uh, but unfortunately, the mapping aspect of the subway is philosophically based on the discredited notions of Massimo Vignelli. Uh, the subway map is geographically distorted, and the uh, geographic map under it leaves a lot to be desired. Um, this is, this is a depiction of, of service in Midtown. Now, this is the number seven flushing line, the purple line. It is true, truly going across 42nd Street. When it gets to 6th Avenue, west of Bryant Park, it does make a turn, but it's a very subtle turn. It goes to 41st Street and it continues north, I mean, it continues west on 41st Street to about 11th Avenue, where it goes downtown. Here, you see the purple line, turning south on 6th Avenue and going down to about 37th Street and turning west there. Here you see the yellow line, the BMT, parallel to the 6th Avenue orange line, south of about 30th Street, and then turning west, and then going north on 7th Avenue well, this is the Broadway BMT, and it goes from Union Square up Broadway to Times Square, where it does take 7th Avenue and goes north. Here is the Broadway 7th Avenue IRT, which indeed is on 7th Avenue, but when it gets to Times Square, it takes Broadway, starts angling that way. Now, on the street map, this gray line is Broadway. What happens here at about, I don't know, 48th Street, I don't know, but it goes in. Uh, this is not a true depiction of Broadway. Uh, also, well, there are many examples of this and I'll be carping about it a lot, I'm sure, but the street, the, the station names are not lined up with the streets themselves where they're found. Um, Here is, a, here is an example uh, of, of what the digitized map makers are doing uh, because they want to show they actually have moving objects. Here's, here's, here's what in essence or in truth is a moving object. This would be either going west on the downtown run of the E or east on the uptown run of the E. And it is actually moving along the screen. Um, they show, they, they've, they've taken the subsets of the set of lines of a trunk line and individualized them. Uh, unfortunately, they followed some of the standards of Mr. Vignelli. Uh, there's a dot here to indicate that the one stops there and a dot there to indicate that the two stops there. At least they have the number or, so, or letters of the line at the stations. But here, emulating Vignelli again, they're at an angle uh, which uh, makes no sense in terms of legibility. And you can see that, that this is named West 50th Street. It's in a dark gray type against a gray, light gray background. Uh, but why they don't have the 50th Street station, the 50th Street is beyond me. The same over here on 8th Avenue. And this is, this is 7th Avenue here. Uh, this is actually where the, where the PMT is operating. It's actually operating along here. Uh, and they show 7th Avenue perfectly clearly, uh, but why they don't have the stations there is beyond my ken. 
Uh, here, here we are at uh, 70 sec at 66th Street, Lincoln Center. And what do you see down here? It says Lincoln Square. Well, I'll bet you all know what Lincoln Center is. And Lincoln Center is what they identify as Lincoln Square. A Lincoln Square, according to the Lincoln Square Business Improvement District, uh, is just about right here. And the address is on, I'm sorry, on 66th Street. And the addresses go up, whoops. Well, here's an example. Here's the map showing, uh, this is the Lincoln Square Business Improvement District map. And it shows, uh, it shows Lincoln Square right here. It shows two Lincoln Square here and seven Lincoln Square here, which is the headquarters for ABC. And here's how I show it in Manhattan block by block. Uh, there's a new apartment house at, uh, that, that has the address one Lincoln Square. And here's Lincoln Square. Uh, and here, curiously, is Lincoln Center, uh, not as they show it. Now, there are all sorts of strange unknown streets depicted on this base map. Here we are at 61st Street. Do you have any idea what this street might be? Well, it's not a street at all. It's a driveway. Uh, and what is this peculiar street here that tees uh, on 61st Street west of Columbus Avenue? Well, that's a driveway leading to a parking lot. That's hardly the kind of information that is required. Uh, and here, this is an example of the aesthetically pleasing but geographically inaccurate 45 degree turn, which takes the subway up mid block, ignoring the fact that the subway is operating on Broadway. And one of these strange narrow blocks, here's Broadway, right? And theoretically, this too is Broadway. But what are these strange little narrow blocks? Well, they're really the planted medians and why they didn't color them green is beyond my ken. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that why they don't show the number one line operating on Broadway when it's a perfectly simple thing to do uh, is, 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 is unbelievable. Um, here we are further north. This is 72nd, here's 79th. Uh, again, uh, we don't have the subway operating on Broadway. And we have this strange little park up here, uh, which is uh, uh, the playground for PS 87. And it actually does come right to the corner. Uh, it's not set in the way it's depicted there. Uh, also on this uh, base map, uh, you find the same problem you find on the MTA maps. Uh, streets are, gray, uh, at least here they're on the streets themselves. Uh, there's certainly a better way to do that. And uh, here's another take on geographical reality. Uh, the base map that was picked up has different distances in the lengths of the north-south blocks. These decimals are pretty accurate and you can see they all vary. Uh, if you know about the city planning commission or the street commission, of 1811, uh, they said that the distance between numbered streets uh, on a north-south basis is 200 feet. And every 200 feet within a, an inch or so is a block. And this, the average cross town streets are 60 feet wide and the major are 100 feet wide. Here, all of the lengths or height of the blocks vary. Uh, which drove this pedant nuts. Um, I thought this is a more reasonable way to show the, the uh, digitized map. Uh, you, can, you can have the real street name, I mean, the, the station name, 72nd Street, Broadway at Amsterdam Avenue. You can depict the one operating local and the two and the three operating express. Uh, in addition to having the street of operation of, at the station, you can have the street of operation operating along the line. Here's where the local stops. Here we have the playground, which comes to the corner, which it is in reality. And I'm stuck in a symbol of a kid on a swing. 
to let you know that this is not a regular park, but it's really a playground. And here's how it might look at night. The three is an operating, so it's sort of faded out. The two is operating local, making all local stops, no express. So here we see the one and the two uh, in rectangles and the same one and the two up here. I've also, uh, something that I forgot to point out earlier on this map, I've included uh, house numbers. Uh, you know, you don't need a, you, you can't possibly have every house number. It's not a land map or anything. Uh, but here, you know, if you get out of the station at 72nd Street and you're looking for 2110 Broadway, well, if you can find the 2100 is the 73rd, you might find 2110. Uh, the same as if you're looking for two, I don't know, 220 West 74th Street, here it is. And here's 200 West 74th Street. Uh, it just makes sense to do those things. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's almost common courtesy. Um, and again, uh, where, are these, where, are these, where, where do these designers have 103rd Street? Well, this is, the, this is the number one local station for 103rd Street. Here they have West 103rd. Well, that's where the entrances are. Um, there, there is an exit uh, on the southeast corner of Broadway in 104th, but no, the, uh, the real entrances are on the uh, northeast and northwest corners of 103rd. Um, also, uh, if you look at this map, what do you see? You see Hatton Valley. Well, clearly the M-A-N-H of Manhattan has been obliterated by one of these, by two of these lines. But where is Manhattan Valley? According to Ken Jackson's Encyclopedia of New York, which as far as I'm concerned is the standard reference, the Manhattan Valley extends from Amsterdam Avenue to Central Park West from 110th to 110th. From, I'm sorry, from 100th to 110th. This is not Manhattan Valley. Uh, and there's another peculiar uh, example of mapping here. Uh, where do the two and the three turn? Do they actually turn mid block between 107th and 108th? Uh, I can assure you that they don't, because if they did, they'd be right under where my daughter and son-in-law and granddaughter live. Uh, no, the two and the three turn on 104th Street. And the MTA map uh, has it right. Here's how I depict it on Manhattan block by block. Uh, you can you can see the red here going across 104th Street. I even depict Manhattan Valley here where it belongs, and you'll notice the Manhattan Valley is has a different color than the usual Upper West Side or Bloomingdale or whatever you want to call it. Um, however, you might say that with all my carping, uh, here's a manifestation of, of hypocrisy. Uh, I knowingly depicted the two and the three turning, uh, turning east, south of 104th Street on my map. I simply didn't have room above 103rd Street to have the arcing red uh, because, uh, along with the discs, because I wanted to have the symbol for the M60 bus to LaGuardia Airport. Uh, uh, the M the MTA uh, whoops I think it's I think it's fairly safe to know that I know the route of the M60 fairly well. In 1997, I wrote a story for the New York Times travel section uh, on the M60 bus, and here's how I depict the the service, the orange uh, the M60 here and the orange terminal is indicating this is where the westbound 60 terminates. And here in the green box on Broadway between 106th and 7th is where the M60 originates. Here I depict the entire route, goes up Broadway, turns in 120th to Amsterdam, 
225th and across and uh, into Queens. The MTA bus, uh, I'm sorry, the MTA map has the M60 bus accurately de depicted. However, there's one peculiarity. Uh, it singles out the M60 bus at 116th Street, Columbia. And it even has the symbol for the air, airport bus, LGA airport, etc. It doesn't indicate that this is the beginning. It could be that it's because of this uh, street name, but they could easily move the, the name Amsterdam Avenue up north and get out of the way. And here's uh, how the digitized map depicts the M60, originating and terminating at 116th Street, uh, Columbia, where it doesn't. Uh, worse, here's, here's Broadway. They have the M60 bus going up Broadway and going taking LaSalle Street. Now, so LaSalle Street is really 125th Street and east of Amsterdam Avenue, uh, LaSalle Street is demapped because it's where the General Grant housing project is. But this map has the M60 bus going right through the General Grant housing project, which obviously it doesn't do and here uh, we see Cathedral Parkway station for the number one. Now, um, there's the usual question about where the station actually is. It is not between 109th and 110th, uh, which raises the question as to why Cathedral Parkway is called Cathedral Parkway exclusively and not 110th Street. Uh, I don't know about you, when I say I'm going to the West Side Market, I don't say that I'm off to Cathedral Parkway. I say I'm off to 110th Street. Um, in the early 1890s, Cathedral Parkway was invented as it were. It was uh, given that name was given to 110th Street from Manhattan Avenue West to Riverside Drive. And it was, it was named Cathedral Parkway in honor of the cathedral that was going up. Uh, let's face it, Cathedral Parkway is one step up uh, in terms of nomenclature. Uh, it's an honorific, isn't it? It's a secondary name, not a, not a primary name. Uh, so the city planning department gives priority to primary names. Here we say a sign, what do you call it, a street sign. Uh, you can see that 110th Street is given prominence. Cathedral Parkway is, is uh, secondary. And much of the uh, stress on, park, on Cathedral Parkway it is because of this man, August Belmont. Uh, Belmont was the American representative of the Rothschild Bank. He also just happened to be the president of the Interborough Rapid Transit. And Belmont liked to name stations after what he described as prominent institutions, but his personal relationships frequently seem to have governed some of the names. Why, for instance, Astor Place? When Astor Place is off the grid and it's not as easy to find as 8th Street, well, it's probably because the Astors and the Belmonts traveled in the same social circles. And at least one Astor, Colonel John Jacob Astor, and Belmont even struck a business deal. Uh, if you're at the uh, east end of the number one platform of the 42nd Street shuttle, you'll see this entrance to the Knickerbocker Hotel, uh, which John, uh, Colonel Astor built. And that was sort of a quid pro quo because Astor agreed to have Belmont operating some of the subway through the basement of the Knickerbocker Hotel. And Times Square itself, Belmont and other bankers such as J. Pierpont Morgan had financially bailed out the Times in the 1890s. And Belmont and the publisher Adolf Ox struck a deal about the site for the new Times building. 
uh, which was at, at the Gore between Broadway and 7th Avenue at 42nd Street. Ox said that the subway could operate through some of the basement and he thought that the printing presses would be in the sub basement at first. Uh, but uh, why Times Square? Rem remember that the open space north of 43rd Street between Broadway and 7th Avenue was not called Times Square at the turn of the 20th century. It was Longacre Square, here commemorated in the name of a tavern on West 47th Street. It was Belmont, not, not the publisher Ox, who petitioned the city to change the name of Longacre Square to Times Square, and Belmont won the day. Uh, up at uh, 110th Street, uh, you see these glorious terracotta nameplates, and you see this equally glorious mosaic spelling out Cathedral Parkway. As you can dimly make out, uh, here's Cathedral Parkway on that uh, map in the uh, presentation book. Also, you see 110th Street, but Cathedral Parkway is given prominence. That's probably uh, because of Belmont, because Belmont wanted it that way. He was vested in the cathedral. In the late 1890s, Belmont donated this chapel, the Chapel of St. Savior in memory of his first wife, Bessie Morgan Belmont. And the architects were Heinz and Lafarge, who had not only won the commission to design the cathedral itself, they would be appointed the architects of the IRT. On my map, I give preference to 110th Street Cathedral Parkway. Uh, is I'm sorry, Cathedral Parkway is just in parens as a, almost as a as an afterthought. And because of the, I'm sure I'm running over, but this is probably the last thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, there are many ways to improve the regular MTA map. But there are a few things on it that are actually just dead wrong. But here's one that is. Uh, the problem is the depiction of the transfers from the Chambers Street AC station to the Park Place 23 station to the World Trade Center E station and on to the Cortland Street RW station. Unfortunately, that same depiction has been picked up in the digitized version. And just as I walked the undercover routes, so I walked uh, this configuration of, of, of connections, uh, this time with my wife. And the illustrations you're gonna see are from something off the web. Somebody actually had a video and walked the entire length of the complex. And here you see that ahead of you is the E, R, and W and path. That's very far ahead of you. And over here on the right, it says use last stairway for the two and the three. And here is that it's out of focus, but this is critical information. Uh, you can see here's a flight of stairs. And if you take it, you can go upstairs to catch the ERW. But if you go to the left of the stairs and continue on, you come to the two or the three at Park Place. Uh, you can continue if you, if you don't transfer to the two and the three, but just want to get to Broadway in Park Place, that platform will get you there. What can't you do, however? You cannot get from the Park Place station two and three onto the E, R, and W. If you take this flight of stairs, you're met by this sign here saying the E is Straight ahead, here you are on the platform for the World Trade Center. Here is the sign saying the E, the, sorry, that the R and W are straight ahead. The depiction here on the MTA map is wrong. You cannot go from Chamber Street to Park Place to World Trade Center to Cortland Street. You can either go from Chamber Street to Park Place or you can go from Chamber Street to World Trade Center and on to Cortland Street. Here's, uh, here's a cleaned up version of it as I depict it. Clearly, uh, you, you cannot go from the Park Place station down here to the E without backtracking to the A and C. 
And here's how I depict it in reality on the map. And there's something else that you'll see on this map. Uh, one of the great new landmarks is the Oculus. Uh, and here it is uh, by Santiago Calatrava. I call it the Calatravaganza. Uh, if you're looking for a landmark station, you're not gonna miss this one. However, if you look at the MTA map, you don't find it. If you look at my map, here's the Oculus here at Cortland Street, Church Street, and here's the Oculus at WTC Cortland Street, Greenwich Street. And with that, we're over to Karen and it's Q&A time. Thank you very much. So, two, so the two questions I'm going to take, um, or one is from David Wilder. Do you hand draw your maps? Does a graphic art, uh, artist then generate them on a computer thereafter? Does this analog digital approach help make your maps clearer? Well, as this presentation was prefaced, I cannot draw a straight line. <laughs> uh, if I had to, I was asked to contribute a map to a book that was published on mapping the city, uh, people's interpretations of how the city look. And I was, I was asked to draw a subway map. Well, I, I said, I, ca I can't. I can only do it on a computer. And it took me forever to screw up my courage to try to use Adobe Illustrator. And I sat with it with, 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 a, with a colleague for I can't tell you how long. Uh, and he, he would execute what I was uh, talking about. And finally, one day he said, John, why don't you simply try it and see if you can do it? So I started doing it. And the rest is, I don't know, cliche. <laughs> right. Well, in fact, John, you have just answered our second and last question, which is what software do you use to draw your maps from um, Michael Romero? So, um, and that I believe was Adobe Illustrator. Yes, that's right. right. I'd be lost. Well, I think, you've done, I think you've done a magnificent job with it. And John, I just want to um, thank you on behalf of myself and Victoria Dangle and everyone at the General Society, for, you know, for your thorough and thoughtful presentation and the amount of time you must have spent thinking about these things. Anyway, it was just fascinating. I do want to mention again that this wonderful map can be purchased at Book Culture, which has got two um, outlets at 112th Street, 114th Street on the Upper West Side, uh, McNally Jackson down at Fulton Street, and Shakespeare and Company. Um, I think we've we've cut off the bottom of that address, but it is um, there's one on the uh, east side and at Lexington Avenue, and there's one at Broadway and 70th Street. Right. Um, so, John, thank thank you thank you so, so much. Oh, and yes, when will the MTA be adopting this map? Ah. <laughs> Let everybody write to the MTA. <laughs> <laughs> and say, <laughs> listen to that schlemegi on the Upper West Side. <laughs> listen to that wonderful, thoughtful, perceptive man. And, and really, you know, the, the New York subway system is a maze and your map has made it clearer. So, thank John, you. thank you so much for speaking tonight. And really, again, thank you for so generously giving you of your time. Um, to our audience, I want to uh, thank you for attending. As I mentioned, this will be the this is the final talk um, for this fall season. I want to wish you all a very happy holiday. I know all our holidays are going to be rather different uh, this year, and we look forward. And let me say, we look forward to seeing you all physically at the General Society, hopefully in twenty. 21. John, thank you again. And I'm going to say good night. I don't know if you want to say a few final words, John, before we go. I've, I've said it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and, and also, I want to thank Jane for her technical assistance at the beginning of the evening. I also want to thank Angelo Vigorito, who's been behind the scenes for all our Zoom lectures. Again, thank you very much to all our audience and especially to you, John. It's thank been you. a delight to have you um, at the General Society again. So thank you so much. Good night. Oh, and, J and Jane, good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.